Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for having me here. I suspect I may sound a little bit like um, um, somebody who's come to spoil a party on behalf of Boris, so it's particularly kind of you to make room for me in your timetable. <clears throat> I spoke at a conference of engineers on Thursday. They're rather grimly looking at me. Um, and their message to me basically was, look here, basically, Davis has made a clear recommendation. All you now need is for the politicians to get on with it. And that's what they want to see. And uh, I just want to unpackage that a little bit, because what Davis has done is certainly true that he has set a clear direction of travel, rather like the man in those old wartime movies who who stands by the parachute bay and tells each of the successive characters to jump at a particular moment. Of course, that's decisive. That is a decisive move. Jump is a decisive move. But of course, it's predicated on a whole load of assumptions about safety that have been complied with before you actually jump out of that plane to do with whether it's a safe parachute, whether it's been checked, and so on. And what Davis has done is to give a direction of travel decisively, that's undoubtedly the case, but also wrapped around by a large number of conditions. And I know you've been discussing these today, but I just want to run through some of those, some of the more important ones. And also the idea that this is now just a matter that requires the politicians to make a decision. Politicians are important to this. They do have to make some sort of decision but there are other people involved. There are commercial interests, not least the shareholders of Heathrow and the airlines, and it might just be worth having a few words about how Boris sees those as well. So, if we start, first of all, with a crucial set of conditions that Davis has um, imposed to do with the fourth runway. The fourth runway is the one that we should be planning now because on Davis's own figures, the third runway is going to be operating at 90% capacity by 2030, shortly after it opens. And indeed, one of the reasons that Davis has given for why he won't accept an extension of the nighttime period to 7 o'clock in the morning, which is the standard World Health Organization definition of night, uh, is indeed that there won't be enough peak capacity, even with a third runway to accommodate the displaced flights that would come out of the six to seven slot and have to be accommodated after seven o'clock. So we know that the third runway is going to be full very quickly, but underlying all this, Davis has in fact come round to accepting the hub argument. Um, he doesn't say so very explicitly. You can find explicit references in the text, but he has actually, and Boris is very pleased about this, accepted what Boris has been saying for a very long time, which is, of course, that having a proper airport um, is crucial to London's economic success, the country's as well, but his focus is on London, and that needs to be a hub airport, and distributing the runways hither and yon is not the best way of doing it. But there is an intellectual incoherence involved in the report in saying that you need a hub airport, it needs to have a third runway, but we're now going to impose a condition which says that there should never, ever be a fourth runway. In fact, there's the slightly bogus suggestion uh, that you should legislate against a fourth runway, even though that would have no um, binding force and could be reversed. So we really are in this difficult position with the first set of conditions about the fourth runway, that they are intellectually inconsistent with the rest of the report. And I think they deliver a fatal blow, actually, to the argument it presents for Heathrow expansion. We then come to a certain set of other conditions, uh, the first of which I'm going to refer to is air quality. I'm, a, I'm not actually going to say anything about air quality because the rules of the game on air quality changed dramatically quite recently with the client earth decision in the Supreme Court. And fairly reasonably, given his deadline, Davis was not able to take that on board. So he simply added a condition that says, in terms of air quality, this has to be legally compliant. And he hasn't gone into the question whether it can be legally compliant. It's, I don't criticize him for that. He was caught unawares towards the end of his timetable. But the government has to consider that because they're having their homework marked now on air quality by the Supreme Court. They don't have a free hand 
in setting policy. The policy will be presented to the Supreme Court around about December, which I think, not necessarily by chance, was also the date, the leeway that the Prime Minister gave himself for a decision on the Davis Commission report, because the two go so clearly hand in hand that I think they're going to have to come out together, um, if they're to stand up at least. But I don't have any comment on whether Heathrow can meet the air quality limits at the moment, except to say that I haven't found a commentator who thinks they can. But that we need to go further into that, because as I say, the rules of the game have changed. But on noise, the conditions are both um, onerous, but actually less deliverable than they might seem. Uh, first of all, um, there is the, um, the idea that everything is going to have a third, half as many flights again, but everything will actually be quieter. Um, nobody really believes this, and Heathrow is going to have to work very hard to try and persuade people that it actually is going to happen. Effectively, what Davis has done is to take all of the technological improvements that can be delivered at Heathrow over the next 10 to 15 years in terms of noise, and instead of saying that they should accrue to the people who currently suffer from noise, the 750,000 living within that 55 decibel level. In other words, that you would get that number down as a result of technological improvements. He's actually taken them away from existing communities, distributed them around, and said that the number will still be roughly the same as it is today. Um, that is a very important statement because it actually is taking away things that people think and have been led to believe they are entitled to. But in fact, we don't believe that it will be the same number as the day. We believe it will be closer to a million people affected at that, and we've published maps and done modelling showing that on very reasonable assumptions about flight paths. The respite periods that are being offered, um, Davis says, will go from a half to a third of the day. That is on average true, but masks the fact that for some people they won't change, people overflown by the, the third runway, the, the middle runway, they won't change. But for others, in other words, they'll still get a half, but for others, they will drop from a half to a quarter. So a very large percentage of the population currently affected, plus many of the new people affected, will find themselves with only a quarter of a day's respite. And I don't think that's going to be acceptable either. Another point I want to make, which people, I don't know whether it's been discussed today or not, which is very easy to mask or to forget, is what Heathrow says about staff travel plans. Um, in terms of air quality and um, congestion, staff play a very significant part uh, in tying up the road network around Heathrow. There are approximately 70,000 people employed on the site, multiple employers, but roughly 70,000 people employed on the site, and something of the order of getting on for 100,000 trips a day, because obviously not everybody works every day, but people make two trips, and a very high percentage of those travel by car and contribute both to poor air quality and to congestion. Now, as I say, there are multiple employers. Heathrow is one of the better employers in terms of having a very good staff travel plan in place, but it is nonetheless ineffective. And we have something like 50% of the trips currently to and from for work um, being carried out by motor car. And some of that is driven by shift patterns. And so I think Heathrow is going to have to work very hard indeed to be able to demonstrate that they can meet that condition. Uh, what do these conditions do to the shareholders? Um, we're talking about spending roughly £18 billion, which is the money attributed to the shareholders, not what the taxpayer is going to pay. That'll probably be quite a lot more than that. Um, the value of the airport today is approximately £14 billion, so the shareholders are being asked to more than double their money. I know it's split between equity and debt, but I'll assume for the purpose of what I'm saying now that that ratio between equity and debt should remain roughly constant. Um, it might not. Davis envisages debt rising to £38 billion, and indeed in one year alone, on his, finance, on his financial projections, he's expecting Heathrow to raise £6 billion in one year alone. 
um, a figure almost twice what any other private sector entity has ever raised in a year in, in, in the bond markets. Um, do they have the appetite for this, the shareholders? Well, it's clear that some of them don't and that not all of them will be, will be participating. Uh, the two with the deepest pockets are, no doubt, Qatar and China. And if they can be persuaded to invest in substantially the bulk of the funds in Heathrow's expansion, it will, I assume, only be on certain terms. One of those will be a lifting of the regulatory regime designed to protect airlines and passengers from Heathrow abusing its quasi-monopoly position. Uh, there was an interesting flash in The Independent, not that I believe everything I read in the papers, and certainly not in The Independent, a little flash in The Independent a few days ago to say that um, the shareholders were looking for a 20-year regulatory regime. I'd be very surprised if it wasn't a 30-year regulatory regime. I suspect that like Thames Tideway Tunnel, this will not get off the ground without very large amounts of government guarantees. And I'm not at all sure that it's going to be financeable in the private sector, as Davis has claimed. That's leaving aside what the government's expected to spend anyway. And then finally, there is the question of how do you repay all that debt? Well, we know how it's repaid. Uh, it's repaid through a charge added to, to, to allow the regulated asset base to be, to be paid off, to be serviced and paid off. And that charge is borne by passengers through their airline tickets. Um, and, and therefore, it follows that um, uh, a British Airways, which has slightly more than half the slots, I believe, at Heathrow, are likely, roughly speaking, to be asked to pay half that cost out of what they would regard as fares revenues. Whether they're willing to do it on a pre-funded basis has, I understand, been something that's been discussed in the course of the day. Terminal 5 required pre-funding. I can't see how a third runway could get away, get, could get, get off the ground in any other basis. But even if they're not required to do it pre-funded, they still have to collect something of the order of 10 billion pounds plus financing charges um, from uh, their passengers over that period. I did have the chance of asking Keith Williams um, what he thought of that the day after the report came out, uh, and I got a, a studied lemon of a reply uh, expressed largely through facial gestures. Um, but I suggest the rest of you ask him um, and see what he has to say. I, I see that British Airways are not participating in this um, conference. So I think it's fair to say that there's a complex nexus here, a decision to go ahead but subject to conditions. Heathrow have not signed up to the conditions. They say they're working on a package. Either the package meets the conditions or it won't meet the conditions, we'll have to have a look. Um, basically, the conditions aren't changing. They're there in the report, and they're part of the decision. Just as it is part of the decision to jump from the aircraft with your parachute, that you know that it's been checked in advance. They can't be argued away. And we still need to see a case that shows that Heathrow can actually finance this in the private sector without very large recourse to government support. So I have my doubts about whether this airport, this runway rather, will ever be built. I think it's a huge missed opportunity. I've worked with Boris over personally for four years. He's been working on it longer. To make the case for aviation, to make the case for the, for the, for the, um, the prosperity it brings to London, the investment it brings to London, to make the case for a hub airport, but to point out simply that in a city of 10 million people, which London will be by 2030, in a city of 10 million people, it simply isn't possible to carry on occupying valuable land within the city limits with an extremely environmentally polluting uh, facility, which could, like other cities have, been relocated, and that land released for housing. And that context, the context of the spatial city, when we're facing a population of 10 million people, I think, ignored by Davis, I think will weigh very much more heavily in the minds of politicians uh, than it has uh, in the Davis report. And I think in the end, it could be decisive. Thank you very much indeed. I've got a question for you, which you're gonna say is ruled out because it's not part of it. Sorry, but 
Uh, Boris, in his pronouncement, uh, mentioned Heathrow. At London City, the uh, runway, uh, the uh, movements were agreed. The planning approval was agreed, all very de democratic. And then Boris turned it down. It's going to go ahead. All he's doing is delaying it. Uh, and since he mentioned Heathrow in his uh, piece, I'm mentioning it today. What's your question, though? Well, my question is, why did he... Why did he... He's supposed to be the mayor of London. He's supposed to be uh, looking after the businesses of London who supported it. He appears personally to have turned it down after all the other authorities agreed to it. Why? OK. All right. Um, well, Malcolm, I only wanted to ask the first question I know so that I can give my customary plug to Malcolm as one of the leading aviation journalists um, in the country. So you've got that, Malcolm. Uh, the answer to the question, why Boris turned it down, I will just say, incidentally, Malcolm, Boris is democratically accountable and has statutory responsibilities to which he's been elected. So there's nothing undemocratic about the mayor exercising his planning powers. But the reasons he turned it down are set out in the decision letter he gave. And they are the subject, I understand, of a potential appeal to the planning inspector by London City. And it would not be right for me to say anything further at this point about that. But the reasons are there. They're clearly set out. And, and if you want to know what they are, I'm sure I can arrange to have a link sent to you. Can I ask a question? Yes. You went through all the conditions and you said that Heathrow some had, well, some of them, Heathrow had, um, it, it was considering it and considering a package. Um, if they can meet the conditions, will that o overcome the mayor's objections? No, I don't, it won't overcome the mayor's objections because the mayor's objections, we've just discussed the mayor's role as planning authority, which is partly about deciding planning applications. But an even bigger part of his role as planning authority is setting a plan for the future of London. Um, and it's called the London Plan, and it's being revised even as we speak, and there'll be a new London Plan coming up. And it's driven largely, the key thing that's driving all of this is the fact that there will be 10 million people in London by 2030. That's a very reliable, undisputed demographic prediction. Not through adventitious immigration, but simply through birth rates and longevity. So we're re reasonably confident from 8.6 million people today. That's like adding Birmingham. And to plan for that, you actually have to have some sense of the spatial geography of London that needs to be developed for this purpose. You need to have the right places to build homes, and you need the right place to have jobs and economic activity. And what has been driving Boris towards a new airport to the east is partly that there is lots of land to accommodate homes in the east of London but there are very few job opportunities. And so looking at his responsibilities as mayor of London, all of this has to go into the mix in deciding what his position is going to be. What I've been saying today is that it seems to me extremely unlikely that those conditions can be met, and they, they go to the heart, happy. and they go to the heart also of the financeability. And what I have said, I think there's a big challenge for Heathrow, but it still wouldn't be the right answer even if they could meet all those challenges, it might have met the narrow technical requirements of Davis, but it doesn't meet the broader requirements of London as a growing city, which is the mayor's responsibility. OK, so one question here and then a question here and then one there and then we may have to wrap up. OK. Uh, Mike Water, Transportation Professional Magazine. Is there any way back for a Thames Estuary Airport? And if so, what is your next step? Well, the Thames Estuary Airport has been there at least since 1970 with the minority report of the Roskill Commission. And the, the sad thing about Davis, the real waste of opportunity, is that there was a, a chance there to show some imagination and to think further ahead than simply where do you put a third runway, by an, an extra runway by 2030, which was the way in which Davis decided to interpret the task he was given. He wasn't asked that question. He was asked, how do you maintain Britain's status as an aviation hub? And that requires, in my view, looking somewhere beyond 2030 to 2040, 2050, and thinking about those things and about the shape of our airport configuration. And what we've been trapped in for the last 60 years is like one of those frames you have for setting up snooker balls, where it's got three, three corners and the ball is just rocketing. I'm probably mixing my metaphors now 
from one corner to the other. It's Heathrow to Gatwick to a new location to the east. Heathrow, Gatwick, new location to the east. And the fact that we haven't been able to settle on it um, means that that ball is always going round between those three. So even if it doesn't come back now, it will come back within our lifetime simply because, and Davis acknowledges this, a third runway at Heathrow is going to be full by 2030, functionally full by 2030. So the plans for the next runway beyond that have to start sometime in the next few years, probably before any legislation required for the third runway has even been through Parliament. Okay, thank you. So there's a question just here. If you'd stand up and say where you're from, who you are. Daniel Oliver from Infrastructure Intelligence. Um, Daniel, last week I spoke to you, you described uh, the Davis as largely being largely irrelevant. I suppose two questions. One, how do you actually get this long-term vision uh, to happen? How do, how do you, as a politician, uh, help uh, to stimulate this long-term vision and, and get a 40, 50-year vision to be uh, actually embraceable. I suppose, second, uh, you talk about the three corners. Uh, you haven't mentioned Stansted. Stephen Norris really you know, set out the case for Stansted, Stansted, Stansted as being the answer. Should we be looking there instead? Uh, could I maybe get you to take the second question at the same time, then we can uh, rush through them. Thank you. Friends of the Earth, um, a London campaigner. Um, very good to hear your, your points on the Supreme Court air, air ruling, which, and I'm certainly one of those who thinks it is incompatible. But on City Airport, um, I also wondered whether you'd comment about the fact that um, if, we, if we've now got Crossrail going across to Heathrow, irrespective of any expansion at Heathrow, um, the much needed land you talked about for jobs and housing, um, we could close City Airport and allow people to get very easily across to Heathrow that way. Thank you. I'm, I'm not, as I said, going to comment on the London City Airport planning application um, uh, for the reasons um, I gave. Um, and, Anthony, I've slightly forgotten what we was, you were asking about Stansted. Well, what Boris has argued for is, is a, and there should be a new airport to the east of London. And when you, if you remember, when he made his submissions to the Airports Commission in the early stages, um, he gave equal uh, weight to something in the estuary and something at Stansted. So he's perfectly open to that if, if a greater consensus can be built round Stansted than round, um, uh, than round the estuary. Um, I see the representatives of the Stop Stansted campaign sitting in the second row here coming, coming to life, coming to life. So I shan't go any further uh, on that uh, just at the moment for fear of being taken down in a, in a rugby tackle um, or something of that sort. So yeah, there has to be an answer which doesn't involve fitting a quart into a pint pot. Heathrow is physically half the size of Charles de Gaulle. It is now going to be, take up even more land and it is going to blight even more people with noise than it ever did before. It's, not, it's clearly not the right answer. Heathrow is like any other business which has outgrown its premises. It has to face up to the fact that a huge financial and emotional wrench is required to say to yourself that after all these years in these premises, we have now outgrown them. And if, we, if we're going to move, there's a risk to that, there's a lot of work involved in that, but most businesses find that if they carry that move through successfully, they do actually grow and grow way ahead what would have been available in the constrained premises to which they're limited at the moment. That is Heathrow's problem. And the conditions are about not just physical space. The conditions are all about trying to address the fact that Heathrow has outgrown its premises. And, and they're going to have to bite if they mean anything, because they're part of Davis's recommendation. They are not nice to have. An alternative, An alternative to Davis? Oh, I don't know. I could think of lots of people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's what he meant. Oh, I see. On, uh, look, I think the pro I think the problem. I think the problem, Anthony, is that this does require political leadership and. Although I would just never say anything to criticise the Prime Minister and Chancellor and, and our splendid Cabinet, except that they were in coalition at the time. That's the one mitigating factor I can offer. I think it would have been a great deal better if politicians had spent the last two or three years actually engaging with this issue directly as a really important question of political leadership 
rather than imagining that you can outsource it to a commission and then you don't have to think about it again. That was a mistake. It was a political mistake, and it's turning out, I think, to be a further political mistake. But as you rightly point out in some ways, the biggest part of the mistake was that they meant they didn't themselves give the time and attention to the question that it required for a whole three years. And now it lands back on their desk and they have to start thinking fast. It's not the best circumstances in which to do long-term thinking. Okay. I think I'm going to... Uh, a tiny, very, very brief. Go on. Brian Ross, Stansted Rugby Team. <laughs> <laughs> My question is simple, Daniel. If you take the view that 17 billion to finance a third runway at Heathrow is uh, unachievable, how on earth do you finance a new runway to the east of London where the cost is, is put at something like 60 or 70 billion? Well, the airport cost itself was on a comparable basis with Heathrow was only of the order of 20 billion. And part of the reason for that was that building it inside a cleared site with a fence around it is a very straightforward engineering job of relatively low risk compared to building a large amount of infrastructure on an operating airfield where you have to move a motorway. Um, and so actually the comparison like for like was much closer than that. But I think if I can, I know Rita you want to move on, but if I can just draw something out of just this, please, I think there is a question and it goes wider than airports about whether we have actually found the right model for finding investment in our utilities infrastructure. Um, because actually the record on investment in new infrastructure in most utilities, not just airports, has actually been really very poor. And the biggest example I can think of at the moment, the Thames Tideway Tunnel, which Thames Water argued so strongly they should be allowed to build, and what do you find? The moment they're given the prize, they say, well, we're not having that on our balance sheet, and George Osborne has to set up a special purpose vehicle and give government guarantees for it. So it may be that you're raising a broader question about how we go about financing infrastructure, because the, 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 the outputs from the present system, a lot of what we call investment has actually been catch-up maintenance through 40 years of neglect rather than genuine investment in new infrastructure. And that, I think, goes across the utilities piece, as they say. Okay. At that point, we will draw it to a close. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. Go ahead. Thank you.